with that over to Jen Fox. Hey everyone, I'm Jen Fox. Uh, and for the Thank you very much. Uh, and on, on Twitter I'm J underscore Fox and I can't remember that. I, I know, I know. It's really really cryptic. <laughs> So a little bit about me. I've worked in IT in a number of roles for a long time. The main threads of what I've done have been business to technology translation and information elicitation. That's really that my core skill set. I've got a couple cat sores at home. They're helping me, as they always do. Uh, I also really like canning. I like uh, collecting and picking locks. I like to think of both of those as life skills, because you never know when a good life skill is going to come in handy. So we're here to talk about the Moscow Rules tonight. Um, yeah, who's, who here has heard of the Moscow Rules? OK, we got to get like half, half of the room. For, uh, for those of you who have not heard of the Moscow Rules, they are a set of rules that were said to be used during the Cold War by Western spies operating uh, in Russia. And they used these rules to conduct themselves and to keep themselves, their, their lives and their missions safe. And when I saw these rules, I realized that that's exactly what I do when I go to, uh, to projects. I've done consulting for a long time. And so I go to a lot of different places and interact with a lot of different people. Um, I've seen sets that go up to 40 rules. Uh, we're going to stick with the 10 version tonight. The other part of the title talked about detente. And detente is a slackening of tension between two sides. So whether you work in an IT department, a security department, a compliance department, you know that there's more than likely a good amount of tension between what what you do and what you're trying to what you're trying to accomplish and the rest of the business or the users, right? I mean everyone complains about their stupid users and and whatnot. Um, and, and when you've got two sides kind of against each other, you, do, you can't do anything else. That's where your energy goes. If they're trying to circumvent controls that you've put in place to keep them from getting viruses, uh, you, know, you don't actually get to work together. And security really is something that it takes all of us. And it takes, it, it takes the, the whole enterprise to really make things better. And this really is about how you can foster teamwork with all of the other groups that you need to interact with. So whether you're in a position like, uh, like Wolf, who is uh, the translator between the technology people and the rest of, of the enterprise, or if, um, for those of you who were here last month and heard Matt's story, you, know, you don't want to wait until it's the day you get the call from the three and four letter agencies and that you know something really creepy is happening on your network. Uh, that's not the time to start building relationships with the other with the people in your business and all your your stakeholders, right? Um, preferably, you've got some of that stuff in place and those better relationships in place uh, before that, that happens. So we're going to run through the rules and a couple adjunct concepts quickly, and then we're going to look at some scenarios and ways to use, use that. So the first one, assume nothing. And this is really about asking questions. You, know, you have to put your eyes on things. You have to actually ask questions and open-ended ones. I'll talk about that a lot. Never go against your gut. This is about... Um, body language. Uh, there's going to be a lot of overlap with a lot of social engineering concepts. And this is, this is one of them. If someone seems like they can't answer a question that you've asked, and because obviously they're uncomfortable because they're sitting next to their manager, and they're not going to 
give you a candid answer, don't, don't push them. This one's about goals. If you're trying to uh, put something in place that is in fundamental opposition with someone's ability to get their job done, you're, you're going to have a big problem. That's when people are going to start circumventing things. Mind, this is about comportment and minding your manners. Uh, we'll talk about that. Look under the next one. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is good. Uh, this is your social engineering research. This have more than one uh, way to way to approach a given situation. More rapport building, so more of the social engineering overlap. Yeah, don't don't harass people unnecessarily. I know there's time. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Sometimes it's necessary, isn't it? I know. Do right? yeah. you have all these people in this room? There you go. I know. I know. That's why I had I said unnecessarily. <laughs> so sometimes you're going to have to not. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> well, so, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, sometimes you fish, sometimes you cut bait, um, make it worth, uh, you know, uh, just think about it before you do things. So, um, this really is about being respectful of people's time because a lot of times you need to, you're going to need cooperation from people more than one time. And so if you want to keep going back and talking to people, be really respectful of, of their, their time and what they're, the information they're trying to give you. An adjunct is Miller's Law. Sometimes someone, someone says something and if you just take it one way, you, you may not be in interpreting the right way. This is really about perspective. So if you go to someone and you're asking them to do something for you, and let's say their, their response is, I can't do that. What could that mean? What are some of the things that that could mean? Maybe. Yep. <laughs> Certainly. They're busy. They have something else they have to get done at that time. Mm-hmm. They don't know how or they don't want to. Mm -hmm. They might not be the right person. Mm -hmm. It's an opposition to one of their goals. Mm -hmm. So maybe they might mean they don't want to do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> the right person asks, sure. So and, that, and that's really what this, this is about. It's like considering, so it might be, I can't do that, might be true, but what is it true of? The other thing is ego suspension. This is a, a really big uh, social engineering concept. She landed smiling. Uh, <laughs> I recognize the author of the book. Yeah, yeah. And the short form is it's, it's not about you when in, in your interactions with other people. And on the easy end of the spectrum, when you're just having a conversation with somebody, it's pretty easy. It takes practice, but it's pretty easy to suspend your ego. Uh, how many have you? Yeah, <laughs> it takes practice. But compared to the tougher end of the spectrum, how many of you have gotten a request from a client or a manager who said, "Hey, you know, I want you to look at this this problem, and I, I want you to give me your your opinion or figure out a solution." And you do that, and then they make some other choice that you think it, it is completely stupid and doesn't make sense and and that it feels like you wasted your time. Who's been in that position? I live there. There should be more hands, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now which one of you guys aren't being honest? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm crossing my ego. <laughs> <laughs> And on, on that, uh, in that context, it's really hard to suspend your ego and say, well, it's not about the work I did or, you know, it, that, that's a lot harder. So, 
just for our, our, our faux project, we've got a couple consultants come in somewhere. They've got three weeks to go through a company and look at how protected health information flows through the company, who's touching it, um, where, it's, where it's stored, what happens to it. So they go meet with their sponsor and ask just, you know, the foundation questions. Why are, you know, why did you hire us? Why do you feel this is important? Um, and you're not doing this yourself. Uh, and what's, uh, kind of what's, what's the landscape look like? And pretty normal, more normal answers. And then they ask, so what kind of, what kind of, uh, relationship does the compliance department have with the rest of the company? And there's the long pause. And the sponsor says, no, I, you know, I, I think we have a pretty good relationship with everyone else in the company. So who, who believes that? <laughs> like, no one, right? <laughs> no one, because truth it, Yeah. <laughs> well, they, you know, clients love everybody, right? Everyone loves compliance. And why would they lie? You. <laughs> well, when the compliance rolls over every time somebody argues with them, then they love them. But you yeah, can't, those departments. So, so, so this, so everybody in the room says, hmm, I'm a little skeptical that, that the relationship is really awesome between compliance and the rest of the department, but you seem to believe that, or you had some reason for telling me that, so okay. I mean, you're not going to argue with your sponsor. You know, on your first meeting with them. So, uh, so what could that be true of? So they, they, so the person tells you, he says, yeah, no, I, I think we have a pretty good relationship with the rest of the company. So managers a lot of times think the world's funnier than it is, and they honestly believe that it's so. <laughs> yeah. What so person's relationship over everyone else? Well, I know where I work. Eventually, compliance gets their way. So eventually, everyone will get along. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very hard road to get to that point. Well, but once you get there, everyone's very, very happy. Yeah. <laughs> all the that you've been in agreement. Depends on the organization. Okay. I've seen both sides yeah. roll. Yeah. So, so anyway, it's uh, so it's just a grain of salt. Yeah, you know, you've you've had your opening meeting with your sponsor and. You, you kind of take what you've, you've gotten with a grain of salt. And at this point, it's one data point. You, you can imagine whatever you want about the relationship between compliance and the rest of the company, but it's a single data point. So at this point, anything without the context, it's just your own fabrication of what, uh, what may be. So, so we're going to venture forth and find out find out more. But before we go to talk to uh, stakeholders and end users and all those people, uh, we're going to take time to do research. Or as Heather and Doug are, they're going to do uh, go through documentation that their sponsor gave them. They're going to do some open source uh, information gathering. So they've got access to the website, maybe some, some shared drives. Uh, they're looking for context about the departments, about uh, the, the structure of the, the place. They're also looking for some uh, jargon so they can get a little closer to speaking people's language. They're also taking the time to put together questions and so they, so they can be well prepared and make good use of everyone's time as they go talk to them. Analysis. I mean, how fundamental is, is research to going and having, um, to extracting information from, from people from, from places? How much, yeah, it's, it's, it's helpful. And you want, and these guys only have three weeks to go through the whole company figure out what's going on with the PHI, write their report, and present it to their, their sponsors. So they don't have a lot of time to, to learn. They need to expedite things. So they want to, want to be really um, 
on the ball with having their questions worked out in, in advance. So here's a set of questions. This is kind of a little bit of a side trip about questions. And here's a, a few examples of some open-ended questions. And the last two in particular, I think those are random questions to ask somebody when you're just trying to find out about PHI. <laughs> no, some people actually those are the best ones. Ones. They <laughs> are. <laughs> they are. And these are these are actually variations of questions that I ask every time I go and do uh, information gathering and analysis. Uh, the variation I tend to use is what do you like best about your job? And what part of your job, if it disappeared tomorrow, would you not ever miss? And that's really where you start getting the information. That's, uh, and, and you don't lead with those questions. You work to them. But that's where you start really uh, getting all the stuff that you're not going to find with fine-pointed questions. So I find, especially if I'm training new analysts, that uh, people feel better about asking data response questions. I ask someone a really specific question. They give me a number. Yeah, how many how many calls do you take per shift? Yeah, fifty. Oh, fifty. I can write down fifty, and I feel like I've gotten a fact. I can put it in a report. I feel like I'm making progress. It's harder to have that warm, fuzzy feeling with open-ended questions because you just get a whole bunch of kind of random information that you have to sift through and you have to assemble. And early on, it's easy to feel like, uh, I'm not sure if I'm actually going to get the info. When is our report due? When? <laughs> oh, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Um, so it takes some patience and it takes some confidence in the process to go with open-ended questions but it pays dividends. So back to, back to Heather and Doug. So they go, they go to their kickoff meeting, the project sponsors introducing them to the department stakeholders whose buy-in they really, really need in order to go talk to people and find things out. And there's, the, the room seems tense. And one of them finally, one of the managers finally speaks up and, and is, say, all right, so you're the third set of consultants to come and ask me about what my department does. And so that's good to know for Heather and Doug. <laughs> that this is just the, the one that spoke up, right? This is probably other people feel this way. So uh, this is where picking, to pick the, picking the time and place for action. Now is not the time to engage with the department managers in a negative way because they absolutely have to have their cooperation in order to get their job done. So they, they echo, you know, they're, they're very sympathetic about how frustrating that would be, and they promise to be as absolutely efficient as possible and take as little time from away from everybody as possible. <laughs> <laughs> For no third time to charm, Colin. Only if you feel you can pull it off, right? right. <laughs> say, go right yeah, right right. Yeah. I, I would suggest you just get up on the cross right then and there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so their first meeting is with the irritated manager uh, who, who says, uh, hands them a big binder and says, yeah, look, this is what you need to know, and you don't need to waste my people's time. So, awesome. You know, that's always a good first meeting. And so how many of you believe that everything about Manager One's department, like all the information and what's happening with it, is in that binder? We read about three years ago. How big is the binder? Everything you want to know is in that binder. <laughs> Otherwise, they would be fired. <laughs> I mean, that binder is theory. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can check the level of dust in the layer of dust. Well, they blow it off. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to suspend ego, say this is not about me. This is about whatever's going on with that manager. And the manager doesn't want us in the department because what could that be true of? Because he feels the binder actually is accurate. Maybe. Uh, so that no one ever listens any to the last three people that came to us. So mm -hmm. we quiet last time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe he maybe he doesn't really know what's at, what's in his department. You don't want out, you don't want consultants coming in and exposing stuff. Maybe maybe he helps the proposal up, update the actual book to turn it back in. <laughs> maybe he's worried it'll just mean more work. Yeah. So grammar check the book and then give it back. You bring your own cloth. <laughs> So, so grudgingly, manager one says, yeah, fine, you can talk to a few of my people. And so Heather and Doug go off and have their meeting with, you know, they go to someone's cube, um, they introduce themselves, hey, we're here to look at PHI, how it flows to your company, and so we're going to all the departments and talking to people. Before we get started, do you have any questions? And the nervous looking person says, are you here to, to get rid of people? <laughs> <laughs> so obviously manager one did not set anything up with his people, did not give them give them any any clues. Um, that's not good. So Heather and Doug obviously say, no, 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 we're, that's not our thing, really. We're looking at information, and, and that's all. Um, so they go and they ask their, their, all their open-ended questions. People start relaxing. Uh, these last two things are actually direct quotes from uh, people that I've done a process analysis with. And, uh, yeah, and I feel like I'm being interviewed for a magazine. Now, no one's ever asked me this stuff before. What Can kind of... Couple pictures of... What, <laughs> <laughs> send, send them one of those things of people, of them, themselves <laughs> on people. Uh, what kind of information do you think... How, how do you think the information flow was from the person who felt like they're being interviewed for a magazine? Pretty good. <laughs> and you find out a lot of information that way. Like more than what you need for for the actual deliverable. I don't want to work there. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I always do. <laughs> uh, there you go. So uh, my my assume nothing lesson is even when someone said no, they're expecting you. Don't assume that they that they are. Uh, more times than, than not, I've had people say, no, I, yeah, I didn't get that phone call. So, uh, so you have to start being really friendly and social engineering, like really right up front. No, I'm supposed to sit in your account payable department. Um, this one, everyone is potentially under opposition control is a, a, an important one here. If you've got someone who's nervous that you're going to maybe eliminate their, their position. What's the quality of information you think you're going to get from them? Yeah, yeah, not very good. It's not going to be honest information. And you're probably not going to find the interesting stuff that you really want to find where things aren't the official process. Um, and the open-ended questions, obviously, lulling them into a sense of complacency, you get much better. Um, a better return. Hey, we found out that manager one's department processes that information three times manually. What the heck? And there's all kinds of undocumented exceptions to the process. That'll be a good report. So Heather and Doug wait till they go off site. They go back to their home base before they discuss uh, their impressions of, of the place. And why why is it a good idea for them to wait till they're off-site before they share their impressions? It doesn't work there. 
Right, and if you're in the elevator, I mean, you don't know when you're writing down the the elevator and talking about what you know what a jerk manager one is or uh, something like that. You could be standing next to next to his brother-in-law or something. You don't know. Or sister, or or anyone, anyone. Customer. So, um, and at that time, when you're off in at a client site or in another department, you are the face of your company or your department. And how they experience you is the impression that they'll have of that company. And, and we've all had that experience when you call uh, customer service, you have, you've gotten a product, you've got some problem, or you've gotten a bill and there's something wrong with it, you call customer service and you get someone who can't help you and isn't interested in helping you. And Unless the person, the manager, after that you get to talk to, gives you the world's best customer service ever, um, you start having a bad impression of that of that company. You think, oh, I'm changing providers. I, I hate this company. This happens every time I, I talk to, to their people. So you're not thinking, oh, Joe's a customer service person. Wow, he, maybe he needs a different job. You know? <laughs> no, you think, I hate AT&T or whatever. So Heather and Doug have been going around asking their open-ended questions. People are giving them all kinds of information. They're getting lots of good stuff. And then they go to their uh, meeting with someone who has um, been kind of put, put forward to them as a subject matter expert. They're supposed to know, someone's supposed to know everything about a certain process. And her manager set up the meeting in a conference room for, for everyone. And, that was good, and they started asking their questions. And as the meeting goes on, you know, they're getting these like three-word answers, and and it, yeah, <laughs> concise to say the least. And as the the meeting goes on, she's getting like smaller and smaller and smaller in her chair, and there's less eye contact, and. And they think, okay, well, let's try asking the questions a different way. Or maybe this is a little intimidating. Let's dial it back and ask, you know, throw some softball questions. That's not working. Guaranteed answer. Yeah. Full of confidence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not going to tell uh, Yeah. And they, uh, obviously, it's just not going to happen. Even though this is someone who's really supposed to know everything. The, the information isn't forthcoming, and now it's just getting awkward and even more painful for everyone in the room. So they thank her for her time and ask, hey, if we have some questions, can we give you a call or send you an email? And can we come observe you in the, the doctor's uh, case room tomorrow? And she says, sure. So uh, sometimes you just have to you know, cut, cut bait and figure out another way, you know, maybe another day. Maybe she just wasn't having a good day. Maybe, you know, who knows. Um, but, you know, there's always you know, another time. And uh, the next day they go off to the case room, and they're, they're watching. There's all kinds of information there. This is the, the room where um, doctors and surgical staff are uh, getting information about their, their cases and the, the patient, the procedure, all of that before they um, go perform the procedures. Uh, a lot of information there. They sit and uh, go, they watch, they kind of hang back in the corner, watch how, whatever, what's going on with everything. There's information on screens and in folders. And when there's a break in the action, they, they go and, and talk to their silent SME, who then is an absolute fountain of information. When they can walk up to her and say, so, so what's in these folders? So what happens to it after there's the surgery? What happens to the papers in the folder? Or what's that stuff that's up on the, the screen? And there's like no end to the information that they're getting at that point. So sometimes, it, partly it's, it's being able to identify uh, 
things, things about uh, either body language, but also personality types. So someone who's really introverted, you're going to take them to a conference room. So you've got one introverted person being interviewed by two people in a conference room. And, there's, and, and sometimes introverts just, you know, um, speaking as one, our, our brains just like, can shut down. And it's not that the information's not there. It's not that we wouldn't like to give it to you. It's, uh, it's just the, the process. And that's actually true. Anytime you're asking people about things they do all the time, uh, someone who's done a job for years, there's so many details that is, are almost not perceptible to them anymore because they've just internalized them so much. So having people in their own environments you can, you can build rapport. People are more comfortable. You can build rapport. There's a lot of cues. You can say, hey, what's this binder with all the dust on it? Uh, or, or what have you. And so there's thing, ways that you can talk to people. Could it also be that they're more of a visual person, and when you're there in the environment, what's this right here? They're looking at it, mm -hmm. and that's what they're more comfortable with? Yeah. Or it's easy, just easier to remember when you can look around and all of the, the stuff is right there. So there's other things to focus on instead of uh, the two people sitting across the conference there. table. Yeah. Who's behind that mirror over there? <laughs> it was that conference <laughs> room. <laughs> the interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> the interrogation conference room. Oh, my, that's not quite bad. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a human bed. Yeah. When you actually talk to someone if they're at their desk, I mean, if the desk, I mean, it isn't something you do where everyone's completely separate. I mean, do you find that challenging when you're trying to talk to somebody? One, you're trying not to interrupt people around the area at the same time. But do you find that they'll actually tell you more if they're open in a conference room that they wouldn't actually say at their desk? It, that's a great question because it really it depends on the nature of what you're asking about. So if you're just trying to find out how a process works, um, you know, show me how you how you enter this this form, or I'm going to just sit in while you take some some calls. Then it's better to be in their environment. If there's something, I, I would say if you're somewhere you're asking questions and then you're starting to to recognize cues where. They're giving you the official answer, but clearly, you know, they start glancing around or they start looking uncomfortable because, you know, everyone around can, can hear and maybe they have some other answer. That's when conference rooms yeah, are maybe going to follow. Where they prefer you to, like, to kind of lead that, that part of it. So if you, just, you say if you put it for here or there, or is it more along, do you want to still control the, the location and... I, you know what I mean? It's yeah. Sometimes you sometimes you don't really have a have a, a choice. Okay. Um, my preference is usually for people's own spaces, just because it's a lot easier for report building. Right. You can say, "Oh, hey, yeah, but what kind of a cat is that?" Right. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and it's just easier to to get things off to to a good start. But sometimes the nature of the project or the nature of the client dictates that no, we're just going to have all of us in a conference room for six hours, and then you'll get all the information you need. Yeah, when I did a PHI mapping, I once interviewed 25 people in one meeting that lasted for three hours, all at the same time. That was the worst meeting I've ever had. Because <laughs> <laughs> one person will stop the other person, right? Yeah. <laughs> the manager said you get the official answer to everything. Exactly. Well, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to have the entire uh, medical staff for that division give all their answers in a coordinated fashion, and it took three hours. And it said exactly what their flowchart showed. Yeah. <laughs> Which was not what they were doing. Oh, odds are, right? Yeah. Almost never. So, uh, so your mission, should you choose to accept it, uh, assume, assume nothing. I mean, practice assuming nothing and say, all right, I know I need to ask questions and not just the data point questions. 
the next one. What are what's the goal of the person that you're talking to? You know, for most people, it's yeah, I want to get my job done reasonably well. I want to have a pretty good day, as good as possible. I want to, you know, keep collecting my check, then go home. <laughs> right, I want to be no worse off than when you got here. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Um, and what, whatever, yeah, if you can figure out what what some of those things are that fundamentally people are going to care about, which is often what are they getting measured on. Now, you want to work with that, not against that. You don't want to put something in place that now makes it harder for somebody to accomplish whatever is going to get them a raise. Um, there are a lot, there are a ton of, ton of books about the next, the next two things. There's a lot of good resources. Um, paying attention to the culture and the environment, especially if you kind of go in and out of different places, if you're consulting. If the place really hierarchical, then you should not ever jump, jump ahead. Is the, the person you're talking to really formal? Are they really informal? Do they, um, people who, who are concrete thinkers or very conceptual, those are very good things to be able to recognize because it can, uh, if you can um, modulate what you're doing to make, make it more um, palatable to the person you're talking to, working with their proclivities, uh, you're going to get farther. I had uh, a coworker once. Uh, this was a, a, the early '90s, over at the IBM Consulting Group, and IBM had just gotten a brand new CEO, and this guy was a maverick. He wore a blue shirt. <laughs> that was, yeah. I don't know those people. <laughs> Yeah, neither do we, Wolf. <laughs> so, and there are, and we'd read in the graph. I was working in the graphics department, at the time, and uh, and so we'd read interviews with this guy. I mean, there were all these articles about how he was so different than all his predecessors, and he had this open door policy. And so, my coworker said he has an open door policy. Well, I've got ideas. And he has an open door policy. I'm going to write an email, and I'm going to tell him what I think about how the how this consulting group is doing. And he really earnestly, he worked hard, uh, earnestly wrote this email and clicked send, and was fired the next day. <laughs> it rolls back downhill quickly. Um, and and there is like culturally. He, he went, I don't know, 10 steps up above where we were. And that was just open door means open to people who report to you, not to like literally everybody in the company. And it was still, and even though we had this new CEO who wore a blue shirt instead of a white one, um, it uh, still, the, the company's culture wasn't actually different. So, so being able to recognize things like that where you can go wrong quickly are really important. Um, and also body language, being able to recognize that whoever you're talking to is uh, uncomfortable or that there's maybe more information to be drawn out than, than what you're getting. And some of that can be body language cues, some of that's Verbal, verbal cues called text bridges where things, people gloss over things. Um, as you, you learn to pay attention to what other people are doing and also how, how you're presenting um, to either help somebody feel more comfortable or maybe to help someone feel less comfortable uh, to, to give you information um, accordingly. And expand your people skill set. It is a lot of what this is about. Um, but having more than one technique at your disposal when you're trying to, to go collect information, understanding that there's different ways to get at the information that you need because 
more, more likely than not, you'll need more than one approach. Um, how many people here do like pen testing or CPS? It should be like, oh yeah, I was going to say it should be like practically all of you. <laughs> um, if you go to, to do something, how many scans do you do? One? One That's on the Uber scan? I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, and how many exploits do you try if you're if you're doing oh. doing a test? Yeah, yeah, not just one. Um, you you try a whole bunch of different things to get at where where you want to go, and this is the this is the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here's a, a few books that um, the subject that I like. Also at the the, the bottom, books from other disciplines. Information security is a really young discipline. And a lot of things we do, uh, other disciplines have been doing for a lot longer. Law, yeah, yeah, law enforcement, anthropology. Um, psychology. psychology. Marketing. Yeah, so there's a lot of other disciplines. Sales. Doing, yeah. How long has sales been around? As long as as long as law enforcement. As long as there's been a sucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, so I've actually found other disciplines to be really good resources for um, books about, about techniques or ideas or skill sets, just because a lot of them have been thinking about it longer and have been doing it longer. So they're more refined in what they're thinking about. Just one comment. Confidential went, went out of print. What? It is, there's currently only one place for to get it. Really? Yes. Social engineering at social-engineer.org had some copies. Oh, no kidding. They interviewed the guy on the podcast and were able to get their hands on, I don't know whether they did a short run or there were some books that were sitting in storage, but it, it was? Yeah. It was I couldn't remember. Yeah, because they had, they also had some that they were selling at DEF CON, so there might be some available still. Oh, okay. Oh, good to know. Yeah. Good to know. Buy them today. No. Uh, if you want it. Yeah. Better go before it's gone. Yeah. So, no. Contact information. Any questions? Are you going to push your broker stuff to the website site? Sure. Sure, I'd be happy to. All right, well, thanks a lot. So this is a talk that you plan to do previously at GERCON? Yeah, or I'll come, yeah, previously at yeah, B-Side. Yeah. I was just saying lost, for GERCON. I was Sandbag. I lost my voice yeah. like right before, so.